Hi, wow, thank you everyone for joining us today for our third leaf learning series, Demystifying Cannabis for the Older Adult. Hopefully you've been able to watch the quick tutorial video to help you navigate the Hopin platform, but if not, don't worry. We have staff on hand to guide you where you need to go by way of our chat feature on the right of your screen or by following the prompts on the left that indicates which sessions are live. Everything you see here today was created and led by Leaf 411's Chief Nursing Officer, Eloise Thiessen. Eloise is a board certified adult geriatric nurse practitioner with over 20 years experience in nursing. She started her own cannabis practice about six years ago and she has treated over 6,000 patients using cannabis. Eloise is the current president of the American Cannabis Nurses Association and is currently an instructor at the Pacific College of Health and Science in San Diego. I would like to kick off this event with a huge thank you to our generous sponsors. First, our premier sponsor, 1906. And here's Jackie Cornell, Chief of Policy and Health Innovations for 1906 to say a few words. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you here today. My name is Jackie and I'm with 1906, as was mentioned. Um, I want to talk a bit about who we are as a brand and a bit about myself. My background prior to joining the cannabis industry was in public health. And a big part of why I joined a company like 1906 was because of its commitment to serving sort of a new frontier of cannabis. So we created an entirely new industry called functional cannabis. We prioritize low dose, rapid onset, reliable edible products that get away from the idea of a general high in favor of curated outcomes. And so we believe that cannabis is one of the most versatile and effective medicines on earth. And we wanna destigmatize the plant and introduce it to vast new audiences, maybe like many of you today. And in short, we think that cannabis is in need of a desperate makeover. And so to deliver on that promise, we developed our drops, which are farmer grade swallowable pills that address so many of the everyday human needs. So it's cannabis that's easy to use, like an everyday medicine, right there in your medicine cabinet next to your ibuprofen, Xanax, Ambien, Viagra, or maybe even replacing some of those. And that's what we hear from so many of our consumers. For us, it was important to develop pills in a format that's familiar to so many, convenient, discreet, and it's something that you can use at home, at work, or on the go. They're convenient, predictable, and they're one of the healthiest ways to consume cannabis because they're calorie-free, vegan, non-combustible. Um, so it's really trying to recenter the plant in a place that is kind of eschewing so many of the old standards of looking at cannabis. What's really exciting for us, and we are so proud to have the technology um, that all of our products have an onset of 20 minutes. So for so many who have heard the horror stories of over consuming an edible because it took 60, 90, 120 minutes to kick in, we've patented technology that we worked for several years with a Canadian based company to make sure that our products are entering your system and you're starting to feel the effects fast to eliminate those bad experiences when people over consume. And it's typically that slow onset that's made edibles impractical for therapeutic use. And for us, that was a really big part of what we were trying to do. We have also moved away from the idea that cannabis consumers need to understand an entire lexicon of verbiage between strain types and uh, experience levels and, and terpene levels to really center it on how does someone want to feel today. So for us, we center on what would you like to fine tune? And our brand has sort of moved into that mindset of what do adults and particularly older adults want to target? And those are things typically like sleep, concentration, energy, relaxation, sex, and overall mood. And so instead of trying to say how high would you like to get, let's talk about a strain, we center on how do you want to feel today? What's also really exciting about our products, and I can show you and you've seen uh, in the videos some great examples, is that we've really made the branding something that I think speaks to so many individuals. It's sleek, it's simple, it's color coordinated, and sort of gets away from a lot of the old adage of bright stoner s you know, packaging, and really wants to be something that you feel comfortable having in your medicine cabinet, comfortable having in your purse or in your pocket. 
um, because we think that that's where cannabis should be seen and centered as medicine and as something that we're not embarrassed or stigmatized to use. So I'm really excited to be with you all today. I think that this is an important conversation. Um, we see in so many of the states uh, that we carry our products, our products are on the shelves in Colorado, Oklahoma, Illinois, and Massachusetts with many more to come, that we are overwhelmingly popular with those who are new to cannabis consumption and for those who are uh, looking for something to use every day sort of to supplement their life and make their life better. And for so many older Americans, that's exactly the kind of, you know, the, the bucket that you're falling into as well. So I'm so thankful to be here. I'm so excited for this conversation that you're all gonna have today. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy our products if they're in your state sometime soon. Oh, thank you, Jackie. Next is a heartfelt thank you to our session sponsors that are all a part of LEAF 411's family of support members whose generous monthly donations to LEAF 411 continue to keep our nonprofit services free for you, just like tonight. Now for our programming. Aging is a dynamic process. As we grow older, we build up wisdom, skills, and insights that power up the communities around us. And how well we thrive as we age is really a question of how well we take care of our health. Everyone is more likely to enjoy positive aspects of aging like good health, personal growth, longevity, and expanded productivity if we start to think a little differently about plant medicine and how we can safely and effectively incorporate that into our daily regimens. At LEAF 411, we believe that using cannabis as part of your plant medicine is a journey, like learning a new language. It takes more than one lesson to become fluent. You have questions, but you don't know who to ask, and that's where LEAF 411 comes in. LEAF 411 began as a solution to a problem. Where do you go when you have questions? Who do you trust? We're going to play a short video to tell you more about LEAF 411 and highlight all the programs and services that LEAF 411 has to offer. Hi, I'm Katherine Golden, RN CEO and co-founder of LEAF 411. After taking in so much invaluable cannabis education, you may be thinking, all oh, this is fantastic. But what about my specific pain, my sleep issues, my type of anxiety or depression for myself or a loved one? Where do I go now to get all my personal questions answered? At LEAF 411, we believe that using cannabis as medicine is a journey like learning a new language, it takes more than one lesson to become fluent. Likewise, we don't expect you to walk away from a short cannabis presentation with all the knowledge you need. You probably have questions, but you may not know who to ask. And that's where LEAF 411 began, as a solution to a problem I saw from my personal experience because I too had these same questions. I had a family member thrown into survival mode, diagnosed with stage four cancer, very young, children at home, and given only a few years to live. As a registered nurse, I knew how to access the research. I could be there on the phone, ready to answer my family's questions and direct them to the appropriate resources. But what about everybody else? What about all the people that don't have a medical professional in their lives? I'd like to take a minute to tell you more about LEAF 411 and quickly highlight all of the programs and services that LEAF 411 has to offer. Too many consumers brand new to cannabis find themselves unsure of where to turn for help. Out-of-pocket costs for access to medical professionals and finding conflicting advice all over the internet. As I'm sure you know, there is misinformation all over the web. And unfortunately, it's all too easy to get caught up in misleading and false marketing tactics. Looking for answers, many consumers turn to dispensary employees not realizing that bud tenders are not allowed to answer questions that could be seen as giving out medical advice. Because cannabis or marijuana is a schedule one drug, not enough healthcare professionals are knowledgeable in cannabis therapeutics. Additionally, the modern American healthcare system is set up that patients get the quality and quantity of care they can afford and have easy access to creating a lack of trusted resources for your cannabis questions. LEAF 411's mission to give hope for a better quality of life, not a detachment from life as some may think. We believe that knowledge is power, especially when it comes to being in control of your own health care. The more you know, 
the better equipped you are to make sound decisions about your health. Lee 411 believes quality healthcare should be accessible and affordable for everyone. Lee 411 was built on the foundation of trust. When you call, there is a registered nurse answering the phone. Nurses were voted the most trusted profession for 18 years in a row. We get a lot of callers who are brand new to the cannabis plant and are looking for products and retailers or dispensaries that they can trust. When discussing cannabis products with callers, our loyalty is first and foremost to the public. While the cannabis industry gives philanthropic dollars to Lee 411, it is vitally important for our community to know that we consider ourselves to be patient and consumer advocates first and foremost. You can access cannabis education from trained medical professionals by way of our three programs. First is the hotline program. You have Monday through Friday access to cannabis trained registered nurses. With this hotline, we've helped our public understand important information like the difference between CBD hemp and marijuana, how to read the sometimes very confusing product labels, which is vital to understanding how many milligrams you are actually consuming. We also have a chat feature with access to send us a message. In addition to the hotline program, we educate in the community through our community outreach program like our virtual LEAF learning series events. Our community outreach program is where LEAF 411 comes to you. We meet you wherever you are. That could be virtual, in your home for an event, or at a community group like your veterans meetings, various support groups, senior living facilities, etc. As part of our community outreach program that is focused on public access to balance education and in answer to the misconception that there is not enough cannabis research, we created a robust LEAF library. This library is user-friendly, has a searchable database that we built for you to see the same study research and peer-reviewed articles that we do. You don't have to take our word for it. You can see the science for yourselves. Just type in almost any condition and you will see many links to articles and studies that you can print and take to your clinical team for a candid cannabis conversation. LEAF 411 could not do all of this for free for you without the charitable support of the industry members you see here today and listed on our website. All of these members give LEAF 411 philanthropic funding to help keep our services free for you. Not only do our members donate the money needed to keep these programs free to our public, but they also donate their products and services to our affordability program for patients in need. But we can't help as many people as possible without your help. There are a few ways you can get involved. We would love you to tell everyone you know about our free community support programs. Help spread Lee 411's mission to family, friends, and any businesses that would be open to hearing about the public service we provide. Please tell your favorite dispensary or brand that you would like them to become a Lee 411 member to support the programs that support this community. We would kindly ask you to please support the cannabis businesses that support us. These businesses truly care about harm reduction with cannabis and to prove it, they are more than willing to donate monthly to LEAF 411 to help keep our public safe. Finally, if you have the ability to donate and support our mission, then we are truly honored. Your financial support helps ensure that every community member has equal access to the same healthcare resources everyone else has. With the charitable support of the cannabis industry and your one-time or recurring donations, we've been able to build and grow three different programs identifying and serving needs throughout our communities. Through our free hotline program, we've been able to guide people in over 35 states towards safe and effective use, and our outreach is growing every month. With your continued support, we can hire more nurses to support our busy hotline. Pre-COVID, we were educating about this public service in person, and now we've had to adapt to a virtual outreach to continue meeting you where you are, where we all are in our homes. What does all this mean for you? We're helping people save money, especially for brand new cannabis consumers. Calling us to get the 411 helps prevent the need for 911. Instead of using products wrong, 
get the information from us for free and learn ways to prevent the need for a costly ER visit. We can also save people time. An average call, which is typically between 20 and 40 minutes, you can get all of your questions answered and be pointed in the right direction. If you compare that with say consulting Dr. Google, where you're desperately trying to find the right keywords to type in and hopefully find some of the information you're looking for, then trusting that source and then reading and understanding what is written all by yourself, the LEAF 411 service can save you time and energy by allowing the professionally trained nurses to guide you to those resources. To close out the who, what, and why LEAF 411 was created for you, I'd like to ask you to please give our free cannabis trained nurse hotline a call. Get the answers you need to ensure you are well on your way to a successful and responsible use of this medicinal plant. Thank you. Now that you have heard what LEAF 411 can do for you, let's start learning how to incorporate this medical plant into your regimen safely and effectively. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Dr. Grinspoon has long been considered an expert on cannabis medicine, especially as it pertains to use among older adults. Dr. Grinspoon will address stubborn cannabis misconceptions, share research supporting the therapeutic applications of cannabis, and detail his personal experience utilizing cannabis to overcome a prescription opioid addiction. Take it away, Dr. Grinspoon and Eloise. Thank you so much, Catherine. Wow, that was wonderful. And welcome, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. It's a pleasure to have you here today. I'm going to go ahead and go off stage, but I will be monitoring the chat feature and the questions and answers. And I'll come on at the end um, so that I can present some questions to you from the audience. Okay, well, thank you um, so much. And thank you for having me. Um, I assume you could see my slides. Um, let me know if you can't, though I can't see the chat when I see my slides at the same time. So anyways, um, I'm so delighted to be here, and this is such an important topic. Um, let me just set my timer because I can't see my uh, watch either. Um, the slides take up my whole screen, so I can't see anything. Um, and it's such an important topic, demystifying cannabis in, um, older, in um, older adults. Uh, just a couple of disclosures. I work for a couple of um, couple, uh, startup companies. Um, and just briefly... Um, in case, you know, I'm sure some of you have no idea who I am. I'm, I've been involved in this issue, uh, the cannabis issue, literally my entire life for a couple of reasons. One, uh, my brother Danny um, um, lost his battle with leukemia when I was eight years old, but he was a very early adopter of medical cannabis. My parents um, procured cannabis for him in the early 1970s, They're right at the heart of Nixon's uh, war on drugs. And he, um, cannabis was really the only thing that enabled him to hold down food for the last year of his life. And it really enabled him to live and then to, to die with dignity. So like my whole life, I've been sort of, um, understood intuitively, um, and kind of empirically that medical cannabis works at least for some conditions. So I was really immune to a lot of the nonsense they taught us in medical school, uh, when I went through medical school. And then also, um, my dad was a, a cannabis scholar and an activist. Um, he wrote a book in, in 1971 called Marijuana Reconsidered um, that was published on the front page of the, New York, uh, re reviewed on the front page of the New York Times Book Review. And it came out in favor of legalization um, in 1971 again, when about 12% of Americans are in favor, were in favor of legalization. And he said that a much uh, greater harm was in criminalizing uh, cannabis users. Uh, he spent the last 50 years of his life uh, advocating for legalization. So literally when I was growing up, there were cannabis advocates and, and detractors in my living room growing up. So I've been involved in this issue my entire life. Um, I started treating patients with medical cannabis and recommending it about five minutes into medical school. And um, I've been involved in advocacy uh, for legalization and social justice my entire life. So um, I've been involved in this issue for a very long time. Um, there's even a strain of cannabis named Dr. Grinspoon, uh, but it's unfortunately it's named after my dad it's not um, named after uh, me. This is a review from Leafly. As if channeling the brilliance of Dr. Grinspoon himself, my dad, uh, the sativa is a top choice for uh, creative introspective thinkers. Um, so anyways, just a small fun fact. But speaking of 
um, cannabis use in elder adults, I was thinking, what would be a good picture to kind of epitomize this? And then I'm, a friend of mine, Steve Mandilli, who's a wonderful activist, he's on the right, uh, he does a lot of activism for veterans um, in cannabis. He sent me this picture of my dad in the Boston Globe smoking cannabis. So I thought he would, uh, in his 90s, so I thought this would be a good picture to share. Um, this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, when cannabis was legalized recreationally in the United States, they let Steve Mandilli um, buy the first cannabis because he was such a, a successful and dogged activist for uh, for veterans' rights and for cannabis rights. And so he was allowed to buy the first cannabis. And what he did with the first cannabis that he bought is he smoked it with my dad, who was uh, this legendary activist. And they took a picture of them smoking and put it in the Boston Globe. So I woke up one morning and looked at the Boston Globe and like, oh, there's my dad getting high in the Boston Globe. So it was pretty funny. But um, the use in older adults of cannabis is growing uh, quite, um, quite rapidly. And um, in this study, uh, it, um, and I'm sorry that the slides are so small, but, um, and I'm happy to make my slides um, available to anybody that's interested. But in this study, um, they looked at the use in the years 2006 to 2007, and then in the years 2015 to 2016, and the use had gone from 0.4% to 2.9%. Now that's essentially um, a, a six, time, six, six times increase. And you also have to remember that, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of stigma. It's not legal in every state. A lot of people won't admit to use. So um, the, the use is probably higher. But just the fact that it went in 10 years, it rose six times is pretty incredible. But then another, another study came out a little bit later. Um, and this one's from JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, who's notoriously anti-cannabis. These people give me such a headache because they're so anti-cannabis. But in this study... Um, they studied it uh, from 2015 to 2018, and the use um, went from, of course, uh, the little thing about uh, Steamyard that the platform I'm using is covering my slide, but it went from 2.9% to 4.2%. So it went up even further. So the use in older adults is going up, uh, I can't say exponentially, but it's going up steadily year by year. I think this is a good thing. And, and um, we'll talk about why I believe this is a good thing. Um, but first, let's discuss why is it going, the use growing in older adults? Um, first of all, there's less stigma. Um, why is there less stigma? Um, there's less stigma because, um, and I'm going to talk about stigma a little bit later, but there's less stigma because uh, people are more open about their use. And now there are two narratives about cannabis. There's still the old narrative from the 1950s, the cannabis is like the devil's lettuce. But there's also another narrative that it's a helpful wellness um, adjunct and that it's a safe and effective medicine. And, you know, as each year goes by, people are exposed to two narratives, not just one narrative. So the stigma is starting to diminish. Um, and also it's cannabis is starting to be perceived in this age group as safer than the alternatives. Their friends use it. They hear about it. And they get intrigued by it because uh, people are sharing very positive stories about the use. And not only is it being perceived as safer than the alternatives, in, in a lot of cases, it actually is safer than the alternatives. I mean, first of all, let's look at chronic pain. Um, you know, Americans are getting older and in general, they're getting portlier and more arthritic knees and backs are, are giving out. Uh, tens of millions of Americans are suffering from chronic pain. And what do you do from, for chronic pain? I mean, this has been a problem ever since I started being uh, a primary care doctor about 25 years ago. Tylenol doesn't do anything. We all know that. Uh, we tried using opiates 20 years ago, and that was a spectacular disaster. If people are in really bad pain, they might need opiates. But that uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, people get addicted, they overdose, they are constipated, especially in older adults. It's just not a great quality of life. Uh, and that's even if you can find a doctor to prescribe it. Doctors are afraid to prescribe it. And non-steroidals, well, if they don't give you a heart attack or an ulcer, they destroy your kidneys. I see so many patients uh, whose kidneys are just dying in their um, 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, because they've taken Naperson, Aleve, Ibuprofen, Advil every day for their chronic pain. And cannabis, you know, in lower doses, in a way with CBD, in a way that's not necessarily psychoactive, 
is arguably much safer than chronic non-steroidals for chronic pain. So it is a safer alternative. So it's not a big surprise that a lot of people are turning to cannabis, especially as they age, um, as it's a safer alternative. And you could make the same argument for insomnia, these sedative hypnotics, the benzodiazepines, the tricyclates, the ambients that you use, those are, are, are pretty lethal in, in older adults. And cannabis arguably is a much safer alternative for the in, insomnia that plagues so many of us and so many of our um, older adults in this country. Um, the use is also growing because there's more legal access. Um, obviously, people don't like breaking the law. Um, and then also there's more acceptance. The AARP, for example, just last year said we support the use of legal cannabis among our members if um, they live in a legal state. Uh, that's really huge. I actually helped them with that policy. Um, cannabis does so many things at once. It can help people with like sleep, anxiety, pain, mood. Um, it can lead to a lot less polypharmacy. And polypharmacy is a huge issue in older adults. And when people use cannabis, they use many fewer medications. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this later, as I mentioned, but this is a huge advantage of cannabis if you could reduce the polypharmacy. And um, also, it used to be the case that uh, when, you when you recommend cannabis, say 20 years ago, what people had at their disposal was whatever the drug dealer had to offer because it was illegal. Uh, to make drugs, all drugs legal is to make them safer. Now, there's so much more choice of strains, CBD ratio, other cannabinoid, cannabinoids like CBG and CBN, delivery methods, suppositories, skin patches, inhalers. Uh, you don't necessarily have to smoke it, which isn't great for your lungs. Um, it's so much safer now as it's sold in the dispensaries. It's tested, it's regulated. It's a much more safer and controlled things, and people are much more comfortable with it. At least patients are more comfortable with it. We're still trying to get the doctors more comfortable with it. And then finally, it's kind of fun. Uh, I've had patients say, yeah, my pain's gone and I'm having a great time. So there are a lot of reasons why the use is growing in older adults. Now, is cannabis safe in older adults? Um, a lot of times people will argue, ah, but it's not safe in older adults. And the question, no medication is entirely safe. Every single medication that I prescribe as a primary care doctor has some risk and some benefit. The question is not, is it safe, but is it safer than the alternatives? Um, because if you're treating something, you have to use something. And this study out of Israel uh, was a great study. It was, um, came out in 2018 uh, for the European Journal of Internal Medicine. And again, I'm happy to share my slides. Uh, it has Ref Raphael McCoolum on it, which is, um, he was one the guy who discovered THC um, back, I believe, in the 1960s. Um, and what they found, they studied 2,700 patients. And the average age in this study was 74 years old. It was uh, patients that were in pain and had cancer. And first of all, it was remarkably effective. 93% of people uh, demonstrated improvement in the condition for pain. Um, on a scale of zero to 10, the median pain score after six months went down to eight to a median of four, which is just spectacular. Uh, for any uh, healthcare providers in the audience, you know that treating pain is not easy and to get people down from an eight to a four is really spectacular. But the most common adverse effects were dizziness and dry mouth. I mean, that is not really a, a very serious side effects. I mean, dizziness can be a, um, an important side effect if people fall, but they didn't report falls. They just reported subjective dizziness and dry mouth. And if you look at the side effects of, again, non-steroidals with like kidney failure, ulcer, heart attack, or opiates, addiction, overdose, constipation, this is relatively mild. And then if you look at the final sentence, after six months, 18.1% stopped using opiate analgesics or reduced their dose. I mean, that's a spectacular win. Talk about harm reduction. That's really amazing. Um, another study uh, done by the same author, actually, uh, this was in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in 2019, um, showed that after six months of treatment, 58.1% were still using cannabis. And of these, 33.6% um, suffered fatigue, but uh, suffered side effects, excuse me. And of these side effects, um, most of them were dizziness 
and fatigue and sleepiness. Uh, 12% had dizziness and um, 11% had um, sleepiness and fatigue. Uh, there were no serious side effects um, or very few serious side effects. They did say at the bottom that you have to be careful of cardiac uh, and neuropsychiatric side effects. You do, you do have to be careful. Um, cannabis can increase your, your heart rate. Um, and, you know, someone's prone to AFib or to has unstable angina, you, do, you certainly you have to be careful. But a lot of the side effects can be mitigated or avoided altogether if you start low and go slow. And with older adults, you have to start really low and go really slow, especially if they're cannabis naive. Um, but, you know, the, the situation that you want to avoid is people get enthusiastic, they're excited, they hear it's working for their friends. So they go into a dispensary, they talk to a bud tender and they buy a brownie and they eat 50 milligrams and then, you know, they have a panic attack and then, you know, they um, have an arrhythmia. But with education, uh, this can completely be avoided. I haven't had a single patient that this has happened to because I browbeat them about starting with like a milligram and just going really slowly. So there can be side effects, but most of them are quite mild and they could be avoided with education. And several of these studies are really attesting to how safe it is in older adults. And then just one more study along these lines. Um, this was um, from the Public Library of Medicine. Uh, it just came out a, a month ago, March 2021. And they studied um, cannabis-based medicines in adults age 50 years and older. And they kept calling people that are age 50 years or older, older adults. And I sort of, you know, took issue with that because I'm 54. It was sort of pretty funny. But um, what they found is that um, there were adverse effects, just like the other studies, but there were no, there was no significant increase in the incidence of serious adverse effects or death with any cannabis-based medicines, none. Um, and that the only adverse effects um, were seen in those receiving higher THC um, preparation. So again, if you start low and go slow, and this was a big study, this was a meta-analysis with, uh, which combined 46 RCTs uh, with 6,216 patients. So again, if you watch the THC and start gently and monitor the dose, you're really going to be in pretty good shape with the medical cannabis in, in older adults. Um, again, I'm sorry that the slides are small, and I'm happy to share these studies, and I'm happy to share uh, these slides. Um, so what, what are the main safety concerns with cannabis? I, um, because this talk is about old, older adults, I uh, highlighted certain things and um, sort of uh, going to gloss over others. I'm not going to talk about teens, pregnancy, uh, or dependency and addiction. But, you know, storage, you want to be careful. You don't want the grandkids or the pets getting into the edibles. Uh, driving is sort of a complex issue in people as they start going from their 80s to their 90s. Um, and certainly you don't want to complicate that with, with alcohol or tobacco or cannabis. You know, cannabis is safer than alcohol, but you sh certainly shouldn't be driving um, on cannabis anyways. Um, the cognition, I'm going to discuss uh, the work of Stacey Gruber uh, in a moment. Um, but again, you have to think about what else would you be using? You're going to be treating the insomnia with something. You're going to be treating the pain with something. Is cannabis safer or less safe than whatever else you would be using? Um, cannabis does cause a chronic bronchitis. So you have to question whether smoking is uh, the right method of, of ingestion. Um, I think vaping dry flour is the safest way to inhalationally take cannabis. Um, the, the vape sticks, they do have chemicals in them and they could be sort of caustic to the lungs. And, you know, smoking is a ritual for so many people, but, you know, when you smoke something, you heat it up to 1100 degrees and you get the, the tar, the benzene, the polycyclic aromatic carbons, uh, hydrocarbons. Um, and it's really not as good for you as just getting a nice vaporizer, like a mightier PAX or something and uh, heating it up to 400 degrees and just extracting the cannabinoids. So, if people are going to smoke, they should drape, vape dry flour. But, um, you know, they also could use edibles. And again, you just have to be careful with the dose of the edibles. You don't want people to make the mistake of taking edibles and then waiting half an hour and saying, hey, nothing happened, and then taking three more and then getting way too high. That's dangerous. Now, I talked about cardiac before. And, you know, with the arrhythmia, that's just dose related. You have to just be careful of the dose. Um, psychiatric is a, is a complex issue. Um, 
so many patients use it for anxiety and it really helps them. The psychiatrists say, aha, people who use cannabis, um, it's associated with anxiety, but it's like, it's hard to say that the cannabis is causing the anxiety more that the that people with anxiety seek out cannabis. So you could really argue that either way. I've just had a lot of success treating anxiety with cannabis. Um, and then with the medication interactions, this has to go with the polypharmacy. Um, you do like to use cannabis to diminish the polypharmacy, but at the same time, um, you want to um, be aware of the fact that, for example, CBD um, can have medication interactions. CBD works exactly like grapefruit juice does. It competitively inhibits the other enzymes so that it can raise the level of medications in your blood. So some medications, it doesn't matter at all. But if it's like a blood thinner or an anti-epileptic or an immunosuppressant where you do sort of have to have it in a narrow therapeutic range, you just have to let the doctor know that you know, or the nurse practitioner know that um, the patient's on CBD so that they can keep an eye on the levels. And if a person's using uh, cannabis every day, they have higher anesthesia requirements. So it's really a question of good communication between the doctor and the patient or the healthcare provider and the patient. Of course, this isn't helped very much by the fact that doctors can have a very dismissive and snooty attitude towards cannabis. You know, the doctors could be like, you're not using medical cannabis, are you? And the patients are like, no doctor, I'd never do that. And then they just don't tell their doctor and there's no communication. Um, so the doctors really have to drop the attitude and we have to foster good communication all around because that is very, a lot safer for everybody involved. Um, so some special considerations with uh, older adults, I meant to say that instead of the elderly, is that, as I mentioned before, you have to start really low and go slow, especially if they're cannabis naive. Um, we're going to talk about cognition, polypharmacy, end of life care, and a little bit more about stigma if we have time. Um, in terms of dosing, this is just an example of like a dosing algorithm. There are a lot of dosing algorithms out there, but, you know, for example, with a regular person, they start with two and a half milligrams of THC doses, but for frail and elderly patients, uh, and those with severe comorbidity or polypharmacy or all of the above, they should be treated via a conservative route. This means starting at THC doses at one milligram daily and titrating up the THC more slowly. I mean, this is just common sense. Again, if they come into my office and they say, oh, yeah, we were children of the 60s, we smoke cannabis every day, we went to Woodstock, you know, then you're a little more comfortable going up a little more quickly. And a lot of it, frankly, is trial and error. But if they've truly never used cannabis and they're 80 years old, you just want to go slowly until they get used to it. Because a lot of using cannabis is a learning experience and a lot of it's trial and error. And it takes a little bit getting used to, and you don't want people to, people do get, um, there are psychoactive effects, uh, you know, which is why people have been using it for 5,000 years, but people need to get used to it. And um, you just want to be conservative. I, I tell people, if you're going to make a mistake on the dose, make a mistake of not taking enough rather than making a mistake of taking too much, and then start again the next day and work yourself up slowly, you'll get there. We just most of the side effects are dose related. Most of the side effects are from taking too much. So just take your time and be patient and you'll get there. Um, Stacy Gruber is a researcher at McLean Hospital um, at Harvard in Boston. And she did this really interesting study uh, called The Grass Might Be Greener. Um, she studied recreational uh, cannabis users and their, uh, their uh, performance-based cognitive function declined. And then she studied uh, medical cannabis users and it improved. I mean, it was such an interesting study. And I just want to actually read a little bit from the study. She said, interestingly, after medical marijuana treatment, brain activation patterns appeared more similar to those exhibited by healthy controls from previous studies than at pretreatment, suggested, suggestive of a potential normalization of brain function relative to baseline. These findings suggest that medical marijuana use may result in different effects relative to recreational marijuana use, as recreational consumers have been shown to exhibit detriments in task performance accompanied by altered brain activation. Moreover, patients in the current study also reported improvements in clinical state and health-related measures, as well as notable decreases in prescription medication use particularly opiates and benzodiazepines after three months of treatment. Further research is needed to clarify, et cetera, et cetera. 
So this touches on many of the things that I've been discussing. But, uh, you know, and it, 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 she was speculating about why this would be the case. Is it because just people are sleeping better and they're not in chronic pain that they can uh, perform task-based uh, cognitive function better? Is it because the doses were lower of THC? Is it because medicinal strains have higher doses of CBD, which can mitigate a lot of the uh, memory-related uh, uh, cognitive effects of THC? This needs to be studied more, but it really does um, sort of argue against, um, you know, the age-old uh, prohibitionist argument that cannabis uh, makes you um, slower and dumber and it really, you know, the, again, the cognitive effects improved, uh, the cognitive abilities improved, and it's just really, really interesting. Um, I encourage everybody, I'm going to go back for a second. This is The Grass Might Be Greener uh, by Stacey Gruber. Um, I would encourage everybody to check out this work because I thought this was really revolutionary. And again, it goes back to, um, is cannabis safer than the alternatives you might be using, particularly for insomnia and for chronic pain, but for nausea, for, for many of the issues that older adults come into. And again, this is just further evidence. There's so many studies that people peel off other medications when they start using cannabis. So um, I think this is really important research. Um, then just a little bit about stigma. Um, you know, so many of my elderly patients are sort of um, uncomfortable when they uh, come in and talk about cannabis. They, uh, you know, make sure that shades are drawn and uh, they whisper and they act as if like either a SWAT team is going to barge into the window or like I'm going to do a citizen's arrest and, and apprehend them and bind them up with my stethoscope. And, you know, this just really inhibits people from using cannabis as a medicine and especially um, older adults. Part of it is that the doctor's haven't gotten the memo yet that this is a very helpful and safe plant-based medicine. The endocannabinoid system is taught in about 13% of medical schools, which is very shameful. And we just need to dismantle the stigma and, in my opinion, dismantle the entire war on drugs because it's causing a huge disservice to patients and it's causing a huge disservice um, to, to, to everybody. Um, it's really interesting. If you look at who's interested in legalizing cannabis, um, the numbers go up every every day. Now, 69% of Americans are in favor of legalizing cannabis. But all the generations were in favor of legalizing cannabis, except for the quote-unquote silent generation was against it, um, if you look at this chart. And I just thought that was really interesting. And I tend to think that that's because they spent most of their lives um, bombarded with this drug war propaganda. Whereas, you know, the as you get younger and you spent a higher percentage, this is my theory, of your life under um, a time when you've had two narratives about cannabis, not just the, you know, cannabis is bad narrative, um, you tend to be more in favor of legalization. And I just feel really bad that, um, you know, we have so much stigma to overcome. And I think that this chart is really telling. Um, now, in terms of polypharmacy, uh, physicians have a real opportunity to switch and discontinue a lot of medications for cannabis. Um, but it's also really interesting that patients uh, switch and discontinue. And we saw that in the study that I just showed. Um, and this is a huge harm reduction benefit. But another study I wanted to show was a study that came out in 2016. Um, this is right after they legalized cannabis recreationally um, in Colorado. And um, they looked at the Medicare D prescriptions across the board and they all went down, which was really interesting. And I think that you know, people, it, this is a lot about patient empowerment. Maybe this is why doctors don't like cannabis, but it's about patient empowerment. Um, you know, my theory is that instead of going and seeing the doctor and having to go to the pharmacy and dealing with the whole um, dysfunctional medical system. If people have a muscle spasms, they just take a puff or they have a little erectile dysfunction or, or anorgasmia, they'll just take a puff. Or if they are nauseous or have a stomach ache, they'll take a puff. They treating themselves with cannabis. Again, it's such a versatile medicine. It didn't, um, it didn't surprise me at all that the prescriptions across the board went down when they legalized cannabis. It's really interesting. And then um, for end of life care, I think it's so critical that we um, incorporate cannabis. This is such an opportunity to help people 
And, you know, why stupefy your relative with opiates? Again, if, unless you don't like them and want to stuff them somewhere when you could use cannabis. Um, my father passed away last summer and we only needed two doses of morphine. He had three different cancers, but we were able to get away with using cannabis. Of course, we didn't have to twist my dad's arm to use cannabis, but he was so with it and engaged and interactive really up until the very end because he wasn't just super sedated on benzos and, and opiates. It was an, actually a really beautiful thing. And um, I am running out of time, so I'm just going to real quick um, make the last point, which is about affordability. Um, healthcare doesn't pay for medical cannabis, and many um, older adults uh, are living on fixed incomes. And I, I work in Chelsea with a very um, impoverished uh, patient population, and I've had so much success getting people off um, more dangerous medications like the opiates and the benzodiazepines. And patients will come back to me and say, you know, Mass Health charges me a dollar for the opiates and a dollar for the benzodiazepines, and the medical cannabis is costing me eighty dollars a month. I can't afford it. I went back to the opiates. So the insurance companies need to pay for this. They're saving so much money as people drop off all these other medications that they don't pay for, have to pay for as patients stop medical cannabis. They're going to need to have to pay for the medical cannabis. And medical cannabis can't just be for the wealthy. It has to be for everybody because, you know, there are many, many crucial, critical equity issues that I'm involved with, with cannabis. You know, reparations for people whose lives have been ruined by the war on drugs and the war on cannabis. But medical cannabis can't just be for the wealthy. That won't work at all. It has to be for everybody. And I just want to end by saying thank you so much for listening. It was a real honor to, um, to speak at this wonderful conference, and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Wow, Dr. Grinspoon, thank you so much. I couldn't have asked for a better presentation on older adults. I think you touched on some incredibly important issues. And we do have some questions that I would like to present to you. So if you give me just a second here, let me pull up one from. Um, so Katie asked, is there any research about a lack of certain enzyme, she put question mark in parentheses, in the liver that could prevent the breakdown of cannabis edibles? Could the use of Advil, Tylenol, opioids, prescriptions, grapefruit juice alter the breakdown of edibles in the body? Wait, those were two different questions. Can you... I, I think, yeah, I think it's sort of one, you know, essentially she's asking, is there an enzyme that could prevent the breakdown of edibles in the body? Should we be concerned about that? Well, when you take an edible, it changes form from delta nine. It gets metabol. It's different when you smoke than when you take an edible. When you smoke, you get the delta nine THC. And when you take an edible, it gets absorbed in your stomach and metabolized for the liver to delta 11 THC. And it's delta 11 THC is thought to be sort of stronger and more sort of more kind of a uh, psychoactive in a, in a different way. And some people like the effect, but some people don't like the effect. And some people think that uh, people get into trouble with Delta 11 THC because it's stronger and affects people in a different way, kind of psychoactively, which is why, um, you know, many of the emergency room visits are from edibles, not from smoking. Um, and part of that's just because of the dose. Again, people take an edible, nothing happens. They take five more and they take way too much. But some of it's because edibles last a lot longer. If you smoke, it lasts a couple hours. If you take an edible, it lasts eight hours. So if you take too much, you're stuck with it for a lot longer. But some of it's because of that conversion by those enzymes from delta-9 to delta-11 THC. And I don't think there's any way to prevent it um, once you've consumed it orally uh, from, from switching from delta-9 to delta-11 THC. But there are ways to make it so that you don't um, consume it orally. Um, people use tinctures under the tongue. And if you absorb it under the tongue, just like think of someone with angina that has chest pain that uses those sublingual nitroglycerin tablets. Um, people make these tinctures that you put under your tongue that absorbs it right into the veins under your tongue. And that goes right into your bloodstream, bypassing your liver. So for example, you could use a tincture of course, any tincture that you don't absorb under your tongue gets swallowed and goes into your stomach and then goes through your liver. So some of it will become delta 11 THC, which is stronger and in some ways can cause some people more anxiety. But 
uh, I don't think they have a way to inactivate that I've heard of. I don't know everything and I don't know all the research, but um, I, I haven't heard of an enzyme that can inactivate. Uh, there's also other research with like nanoparticles and things like that, that have it absorb and go into the bloodstream and not necessarily uh, go through the liver. So there are ways of circumventing the liver, but I don't think there are ways of blocking the enzyme per se, maybe, maybe in the future, um, but I don't think they've gotten to that point yet. I do think maybe the question is around um, maybe polymorphisms that could prevent the, you know, are there polymorphisms in the liver, genetic variances, you know, metabolism variances that could prevent somebody from truly metabolizing, you know, the THC. I think I've had some patients who will take an edible and they feel nothing, you know, and they've done that repeatedly. So maybe I think you're right. We just, we don't, we're not really clear just yet what could be contributing to that. Right. Oh, there is another, right. There is the other issue of like, I, I have a cousin that like tries, he might, he could eat like a hundred gummies and like nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. And it's a question of like, are they not absorbing it or uh, what, what is the problem? Right. Or do they not have that enzyme? I don't think they quite understand that. I just read an article about that recently. Um, Cause someone asked me about that and I didn't think they, I wasn't convinced they had like a definitive answer as to why that was happening. Um, it's a really strange phenomenon. It is. I look forward to seeing more research on that. Um, some more questions here. Um, so it says, I know a 60 year old that wanted to use cannabis for arthritis pain. Every time she tries to use it, she becomes nauseated and vomits. Do you have any solutions? She tried whole plant edibles one to one, used a five milligram dose, even come cut back to 2.5 milligram dose the second time. Well, the thing is, um, Sometimes people have paradoxical effects uh, to medications. Like Benadryl makes most people sleepy, but like 2% of people you give a Benadryl and it makes them like wired. They just have paradoxical effects. And with cannabis, um, like with the case of my brother, Danny, um, when he was fighting leukemia and he had uh, chemotherapy, it's a wonderful drug uh, to treat nausea and vomiting, especially chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. They think it's mediated by the like TRPV receptors. But, um, you know, there's something called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, where if you, if you chronically overstimulate that receptor, it can have the opposite effect, which is why some people um, who use cannabis a ton can end up, instead of uh, alleviating nausea, they could actually have nausea and vomiting. Um, and it's really hard to tell whether if someone's in the emergency room and they're a cannabis user, if they actually have cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, or if they just have something called cyclic vomiting syndrome, the only way to tell is to have them stop using cannabis for six months and see if it goes away. So in this case, I would say it's a, a paradoxical reaction. Um, it's, um, and it's just really unfortunate. Uh, it can happen with a lot of different um, medications. Sometimes with benzodiazepines, which make you sleepy, people can get really wired from it. Again, it's an interesting uh, and rare, but not at all it's super uncommon phenomenon that people have these opposite or paradoxical reactions. And it sounds to me like either it's an allergic reaction or it's a paradoxical reaction. And that's a really difficult thing. I mean, if it's an allergic reaction, I mean, hypothetically, you'd work with an allergist, but there aren't that many allergists. And I found that out because I've, people consult with me on cannabis allergy, and I've tried to consult with a couple allergists, and they, they're they not that familiar with it. Like, most of them aren't against it. They're just not that familiar with it because they haven't done that much work with it. So um, one way it might be to try to work with an allergist, um, but... Um, you know, if it were any other medication, I'd say take it with cannabis <laughs> to help with the nausea. <laughs> but because it is cannabis, it's sort of like if you're allergic to steroids, usually it's like you take it with steroids. But if you're allergic right. to steroids, what can you do? So it's that's a pretty difficult situation. And I'm, I'm not sure what, um, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. I would try working with an allergist. And, you know, I would try like a, maybe a super, super uh, slow taper, like starting with like a 10th of a milligram, then like a fifth of a milligram and see if you can get yourself like really slowly acclimated, almost like a homeopathic dose and work your way up. That might work. But um, I'm, I'm just really wondering if it's a paradoxical reaction. And if that's the case, that would be really tough. I mean, if someone has a paradoxical reaction to Benadryl, there's really not much you can do. If someone's allergic to penicillin and you need to treat them with penicillin, then 
you put them in the intensive care unit and give them like teeny little doses of penicillin and like you work their way up. Um, I remember that from the intensive care unit uh, stint when I was a med medical student, but that would be a lot of work um, <laughs> for <laughs> someone with cannabis. And I don't know if any, uh, you have a hard time finding like intensive care doctors to go along with it. So. Yeah, it's one of those things where it just may not work for that person, unfortunately. Exactly, and, and there are people that can't use cannabis. I have some patients that just get too anxious to use cannabis. Yep. Not many, but there are some patients. Like the only way they would practically be able to use cannabis if they took it with Ativan, which would sort of defeat the purpose of taking the cannabis in the first place. So there are some people, there, there's no drug that everybody can take. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And someone did ask, you know, you brought up about, um, you know, the equity, affordability and the equity. And someone asked, um, are you seeing any payers who are more in favor of cannabis therapies than others? And I think that's um, a really good question to end on so that um, patients can, if they have a choice, possibly make it. Right. I think that it's very difficult right now because of the federal e illegality. I think that that enables the insurance companies to skate. But there was an interesting case uh, in New Jersey where um, a private company had to pay um, their workers medical cannabis bills um, because, and they tried to make the argument, well, we don't have to pay because it's federally illegal. And um, the uh, the judge said, yes, you do. You absolutely have to pay. This is part of their medical expenses. So they're chipping away at it. But the mm -hmm. minute it um, gets out of schedule one or, you know, knock on wood becomes uh, legal on a federal level, I think that's going to open up. I mean, I'm not an attorney, but um, I think that's going to open up like a, a field day. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to have a leg to stand on at all. I mean, they pay for acupuncture. They pay for many treatments that have much less uh, empirical support than medical cannabis. So I think they're going to end up paying for it. And, you know, another issue is just the veterans. I mean, in Canada, they give their veterans cannabis. Like they, there's an allotment for uh, the veterans. And here, the doctors are barely even allowed, until recently, weren't even allowed to mention the word cannabis. And now they can't certify patients. They're allowed to discuss it if like the patient brings it up. Um, so I think the veterans are, it's really sad how we treat them and how they need it for their chronic pain and for their PTSD. And we're not, a, so I think with the veterans and with the health insurance, we're going to be, um, chipping away at that. But once we get to federal legalization, the whole, the dams are going to, um, open up. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to that day. Well, thank you again so much for being here and presenting for us at Leaf 411 on older adults. And uh, we have let the audience know we'll share their slides with them at the end. So um, thank you again. And I cannot tell you how great I thought your talk was and appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, thank you for um, Leaf 411, what a great group. Thank you. We're pretty proud of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. So good. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Dr. Our Lee 411 support member session sponsors include Wana Brands. Their mission is to enhance their customers' lives through the responsible use of cannabis. They are the number one infused products company with operations across the United States. And we have our session sponsor, Light Shade Dispensaries, with nine locations here in Colorado. They believe the difference is night and day with their top shelf flower, edibles, concentrates, tinctures, topicals, merchandise, and accessories. Lightshade is our biggest supporter, and we truly wouldn't be here tonight without their continued support, so please visit a Lightshade dispensary near you.